Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So problem solving, it's a needed life skill, isn't it? To say that it's a needed life skill, wouldn't we say that's a huge understatement? We need to learn problem solving skills because what's going to happen, what's going to, happen to us no matter what in our lives? We're going to be faced with problems from conflict among friends to figuring out how to make your income and expenses uh, balance out to, to forging a pathway out of debt to making sure the kids get to all the places where they need to be when they need to be there. We need the skill of solving problems. Now there are some problems that you can solve without a whole lot of stress. We heard some of them from the kids a minute ago, right? Sharpening a pencil, uh, deflattening a bike tire, things like that. But there are other problems that require a whole lot more thought, a whole lot more consideration, uh, and a whole lot of prayer. But no matter what, there are ways to address each problem and every problem. We, we may have varying degrees of happiness with them, but there are ways to address every problem. And so our question today is, all right, what about the problem of sin and wickedness in our world? How does God address that problem of sin and wickedness? And, and what can we learn from how he does it? Well, that's what we'll see as we, we begin our series today, History Speaks, uh, looking at the life and ministry of Elijah the prophet. Today we look at the introduction to Elijah that's found in 1 Kings chapter 16. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. At Ahab's time, Heel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And this is the word of our God. Uh, so where we pick up today, there is a new king in Israel, and, and his name is Ahab. Now, now, what is Ahab like as a king? How is he going to lead the people? Sadly, what we're told about Ahab, there, there's basically nothing good. We're told that Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those who, be, who came before him. So Ahab then, he wasn't just a bad king, he was actually the worst king. And the bulk of this Bible section explains to us the various ways in which Ahab was the worst, the various ways in which Ahab led his people further and further into wickedness and into sin, and each description really adding another layer on top of the previous layer of the sin and wickedness that was so prevalent in their society. So what was it that made Ahab so evil? Well, the explanation begins. He, it says, he considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. What that tells us that, is that Ahab continued in the path of his ancestors. That phrase, the sin of Jeroboam, it's a phrase that's actually common when you read uh, the books of the kings in the Old Testament. And it refers in its simplest form to idolatry. Now the backstory of that phrase is this. Uh, Israel had been, under David and his son Solomon, one united kingdom, but then after Solomon died, the kingdom was divided into two. The northern kingdom became known as Israel, the southern kingdom was known as Judah, and the first king of that northern kingdom was this Jeroboam, uh, son of Nebat. And what Jeroboam did was he forbade his people from going to Jerusalem, going to that temple in Jerusalem to worship the Lord there, and instead he set up two golden calves in two different cities uh, in his kingdom. And he said to the people, here are your gods, Israel, who delivered you from Egypt. 
Now this was a special kind of idolatry because what Jeroboam did is he took works that had belonged to God, delivering them from Egypt, and instead of giving the credit and glory for those works to God, he gave the credit and glory for those works to idols. And so it says that Ahab continued in this idolatry, but if you notice, it, it's not just that he continued in it. It says that Ahab con- considered it a trivial thing to continue in this idolatry. It means that to him it was a small thing. It wasn't enough to continue in the idolatry passed down to him by his ancestors, and so this was just the beginning of his wickedness. And so then the next step was that Ahab uh, takes himself a wife, and this wife is Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, the neighboring kingdom. And then through her, they began to serve and worship Baal. So he married a woman who was fully committed to serving and worshiping, not the Lord, the true God, but to serving and worshiping this false god called Baal. And as a result of marrying her, Baal worship was introduced in Israel, and not just introduced, but it was promoted, and it was incorporated into the worship life that the king set the example for for all the people. And in setting that example, he he built a temple for Baal and an altar for Baal in his capital city. Now, now what's the big deal about Baal? Well, Baal was considered a, a fertility god, and it was believed that Baal enabled the earth to produce crops, and that Baal enabled people to produce children. Baal worship was, I don't know if there's a phrase for it other than disgusting. It was rooted in sensuality and involved ritualistic prostitution in the temples. Maybe to put it more bluntly, uh, Baal was worshipped by having sex with prostitutes who were employed at the temples to Baal. And even at times, appeasing Baal required the bloody death sacrifice of a human being. So he incorporated Baal worship into the people, and then if that wasn't enough, he set up an Asherah pole. Asherah was often considered as Baal's romantic partner, the goddess of love and war. Worship as Asherah was very similar to worship of Baal, you know, temple prostitutes and all that. I think you can look at those two idol worships and say, yeah, I can see why God found this repulsive and disgusting. And since the king was living with complete disregard for God and his will, it didn't take long for the people to follow suit. And the most grievous example of that is this man named Heel that we learn about in this section. See, 500 years earlier, uh, when Joshua led the people into the promised land, they had taken and destroyed the city of Jericho, and at God's direction, they thoroughly destroyed the city. They burned everything in it. And after that destruction, Joshua pronounced, Cursed, is every, cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city. At the cost of his firstborn, he will lay its foundation. At the cost of the youngest, he will set up its gates. And so Heel, in seeking to rebuild the city, he paid no regard to those words of Joshua, thinking maybe that, that God wouldn't follow through on them, or maybe he didn't really value the lives of his oldest and his youngest children, or he valued what he would gain in fame and reputation from rebuilding a city more than he valued the life of his sons. Perhaps in reality it was some combination of all of these. But the end result is the same. He willingly sacrificed his own children to his desire to rebuild that city. That's how far godlessness had progressed under Ahab in Israel. And so in this time of great godlessness, what's God going to do? Was he just going to let his people keep on following Ahab? Was he just going to let his people wander completely away from him and be lost forever? Was God going to turn a blind eye toward the sin and evil that was going on among his people? Was he going to stand by and do nothing? Hardly. So what was God going to do? How was he going to engage in this battle for his people's hearts, this battle for their souls? How is he going to fight against the wickedness What's God going to do? Well, in this, into this world of wickedness, God sends Elijah. And we're ever so briefly introduced to Elijah and his work at the closing, part of our, uh, closing verse of our text where it says, Now Elisha the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. What Elijah says there was a direct attack to Baal. You see, Baal was a fertility god. Uh, Worshipping was supposed to bring rain on the land. Well, Elijah's proclaiming, you know, the one who really sends the rain, it's the Lord. 
Uh, and so to show you that Baal is powerless and the Lord is real, since I am the Lord's prophets, rain is only going to come at my word and not at Baal's word. So Elijah was sent to confront that idolatry head on by proclaiming the word of the Lord, by proclaiming the will of the Lord. And in this particular instance, Elijah's proclaiming was to accomplish two things. It was first of all to show the utter foolishness of of idols, the utter foolishness of serving Baal and his cousins. And then together with that, it was to call them back. To call them back to serving and worshiping the Lord. Now, stop and think of this for just a moment. This by itself, that God would even send Elijah, is an act of sheer grace. You see, what Ahab had done, combined with the people's uh, willingness to follow him into that idolatry without a whole lot of complaint, that by itself was certainly reason enough for God to, to turn his back and to wash his hands of these people and just to be done with them forever. But that's not what God does even when his own people, even his own people who know better, fall into wickedness, his loving response to that is to send an Elijah, to send Elijah to call them back. And so take a look at around at our world today. And what do you see? You see a world that's no less wicked uh, in the eyes of God than it was in the days of Elijah. While, while we may not have idle temples set up to, for people to worship golden calves in them, what, what do we do instead? Instead, Most Americans, in one way or another, we set up a shrine to ourselves, uh, so to speak, where instead of giving God the credit for what's been accomplished in my life and God the credit for the talents and the abilities that he's given us and and thanking him for the situation into which we were born into this world and so on, which each of us had absolutely nothing to do with, instead we think, speak, and act as though everything we accomplished is only or primarily because of our hard work, our superior brain power, and so on. We look at the parts of our life that make us happy, and we say, you know what, I did this. I built this. I accomplished this. And we forget. Forget about God's contributions to our life's successes. Uh, Be those contributions natural abilities. Be they loving and supporting parents if we had them when we grew up. Be they chance connections that open doors for us that we otherwise wouldn't have had. You see, when we give ourselves the credit for those things, it's really not that much different than worshiping a golden calf because what we're doing is we're taking credit for something that really belongs to God and we're ascribing it to something that's created. In a similar way, we may not engage in in worship that involves temple and ritual prostitution, but what we've done today is we kind of cut out the middleman and instead we just worship sex and we glorify sex. I mean, it's everywhere, isn't it? Think about any movie or TV show. What's the pivotal moment in that movie or the pivotal moment in that TV episode? Most often, it's, it's the sexual encounter, uh, isn't it? It's in commercials and media. What, what do commercials tell you? They tell you, if you use this shaving cream or if you use this aftershave, all the pretty girls are going to want to come after you. We want to, and if there's a freedom in our society that we value more than seemingly every other freedom, We'd say it's sexual freedom. As a society, we want to sleep with whoever we want, whenever we want, and we want zero ramifications and responsibilities that come from it. And and even in America, we have entire industries set up to remove those ramifications and responsibilities that might come from those sexual encounters. As a brief aside to that comment, uh, since it's been a big national topic of discussion lately with states passing different laws, at the start of our Bible class today, I have a very thoughtful take on that subject of abortion that I would love to share with anyone who wants to stay. Um, can't go into it in the sermon, but come for that in the Bible class and we can talk about it a little bit more. But when you consider how our society views uh, sex, we're really not that much different uh, from those who worshipped Baal. And you see, you and I, we, we are products of our society uh, way, more than we, way more than we realize. Without noticing it many times, we, we conform to the thought patterns and the attitudes of the world around us, and we start to share their values uh, more than we do God's values. But what does God do? Does he wash his hands of us and say we're going to be done, he's going to be done with us forever? into this world of wickedness that we live in today, God still sends Elijahs. 
He sends people to proclaim the word of the Lord, people to proclaim the will of the Lord, people to proclaim the folly of sin to call us back to him once again. You see, in his mercy and his grace, he does not want anyone to wander from him forever. And God refuses to wash his hands of humanity. He refuses to be done with this, no matter how badly we mess up. No, God still sends Elijahs into this world to call us back to him once again. Now we might wonder why is it that that every generation of humanity, no no matter where we live in the world, no matter what time we live in all of history, every generation runs after their own form of idol worship. Every generation has something that we set up and we say, this is what life is all about and this is what I live for. Why is it that every generation does that? Why is it that every generation needs an Elijah to call them back to God? And the answer to that question is that there is something uh, wrong with our hearts. Our hearts long to worship created things rather than our creator Uh, And that's because our hearts are deeply, deeply infected with sin. And so to solve this problem of sin, solve the problem of sin in our hearts, it would take more, far more than simply someone preaching and teaching. No, it would take someone who would come and who would cure those sinful hearts that long to chase after idols, Uh, be those idols golden calves, be they bales, or be they modern-day idols like self and sexual pleasure. And so what does God do to cure that problem of sin in our hearts? He sends, in a sense, he sends an Elijah. But this one who he sends to solve that problem of sin is only like Elijah. He's so much greater. And the greater Elijah that God sends to deal with the problem of our sin is Jesus, his son. And God knew that the only way to solve the wickedness of this world was to get to the very heart of the matter, to get to the heart of our human sin. And God knows that the only way to free our hearts, to love him more than the idols, is to solve that problem of sin in such a way that it leaves zero room for doubt in our minds as to how much he loves us. And so he sends an Elijah. He sends a greater Elijah, Jesus, And Jesus came and he lived a life of perfect devotion to God, a life uh, perfectly free from the love of idols. The idols of Jesus' day, they weren't Baals, they weren't Asherah poles, but I would say the idol of Jesus' day was a smug self-righteousness that was based on adherence to the religious tradition. Jesus' devotion was to his heavenly Father and to his Father's will and not to those traditions. But what happened to Jesus was that all of our guilt, all of our wickedness, the the guilt of all of our idol worship and so on, all of that was placed upon him. And so so when Jesus died on the cross, uh, what God did is instead of washing his hands of us because of our guilt, he washed his hands of Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, God turned away from his own son instead of turning away from you and me. See, in Jesus Christ, God took our place in abandonment. He took our place in death so that we could have life. And by that saving work of Jesus, you're forgiven. By that saving work of Jesus, you're healed. And it's only when you you look at that saving work of Jesus, and it's only when you see by faith the lengths that God went to break the power of idols over your heart, and it's only when you see the, the depth that Jesus went to to rescue you from sin, that a desire to love God the most and to serve God the most grows in your heart. So in a world of wickedness, into a world of wickedness, yes, God sends Elijah's and the greatest one was Jesus, his son. Now there are two important connections to make here uh, based on what we've seen from Elijah. Uh, First one is this, what is God going to do if you're the one who wanders away from him? What's God going to do if you're the one who turns away from his word and and starts to chase after something else? What's God going to do for you? He's going to send an Elijah to you to proclaim the word of the Lord. He's going to send an Elijah to you to point out the foolishness of sin and, and to call you back to him. And so if that happens, when it happens, listen to him. Listen to him Because God sends that Elijah to you, not to lecture you, not to punish you, but ultimately to be a messenger of grace, to call you back into God's family of love and forgiveness. And so then the second connection here is that God sends Elijahs to call people back. Then are you willing 
to be an Elijah in this world? Are you willing to be God's tool to call people back to him once again? Are you willing to proclaim the word of the Lord in truth and in love? You see, being an Elijah, it can happen in our personal lives simply as we live out God's will and as we share his word with the people that he puts into our lives. But being an Elijah can also look like what I do. Would you consider going into full-time public ministry, whether it's as a pastor or as a teacher, because the world needs more Elijahs. As we heard Jesus say, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The world needs more Elijahs, whether it's in personal ministry or whether it's in public ministry. So would you consider being an Elijah in either one of those roles? You see, that name Elijah, it means the Lord is my God. Uh, What a fitting name for the man that God chose to uh, call people back to him, to call people away from serving other gods and so that they could join with him and say, the Lord is my God. And there's nothing that leads us to say with conviction, the Lord is my God, uh, more than seeing exactly what the Lord did to rescue you from sin and from guilt. And it's that that makes you willing to listen when God sends an Elijah to you to call you back. And it's also that saving work of Jesus that grows in you a willingness to be an Elijah for others. So into this world of wickedness, God sends Elijahs. Let us listen to them when they come to us and let us be willing to be that Elijah when others need it as well. Amen.